Well, with all the screeching recently about Vladimir Putin and Russia and treason, it's been easy to miss the real news. We have some real news. The United States is inching closer, apparently, to some kind of conflict with Iran. This Sunday, the president tweeted this, quote, to Iranian President Rouhani, never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer the consequences, the likes of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. Be cautious, exclamation point. Well, the interesting thing about this tweet is what didn't happen. The press is usually quick to jump on the president's intemperate tweets. CNN has apparently an entire team of progressive teenagers devoted to monitoring his feed. But this time, there wasn't much comment from the media. Why? Because if there's one thing Washington loves more than open borders and fat lobbying contracts, it's pointless wars half a world away. Contractors get rich. Neocon intellectuals feel powerful. Bill Kristol, Max Boot, and Nancy Pelosi agree on one thing. War is good as long as the war does not help the United States. John Bolton finds himself in this, that camp. A lifelong neocon, Bolton repeatedly has called for toppling the Iranian government again and again, though tellingly he's never suggested what might replace the Iranian government once it's toppled. Now that he's national security advisor, he has been changing our policies. The U.S., for example, has begun promoting protests within Iran in an effort to overthrow the regime there. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo appears to be on board with this. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley definitely is. Here's a recent sampling of her saber rattling on Iran. Watch. Their government has a long history of murdering its own people who dare to speak the truth. The Iranian regime is now on notice. The world will be watching what you do. If you want to come to the table and work on a new Iran deal, we'll be right there to talk to you. But you're not going to threaten us to do it. Iran may have m messed with the wrong president they here. absolutely did. Now, some of that is bluster, obviously, but some of it is exactly what it looks like, the groundwork for conflict. We are moving toward, however slowly, some kind of confrontation with Iran. Now, that should worry everybody, but it should especially be of concern to anyone who supported the president. If President Trump decides to go to war with Iran, it will destroy his presidency, just as the Iraq war destroyed the presidency of his Republican predecessor, George W. Bush. Attacking Iran is not like intervening in Libya or Syria, or even like invading Iraq. It entails far greater risk and much higher costs. Geographically, Iran is about four times the size of Iraq. It has three times as many people as Iraq had when we invaded. Iraq was a divided country along religious lines. Iran is not. It's cohesive. It's a much richer country, too, with a military that has spent many years preparing for a U.S. invasion. It's a formidable force. In 2002, the U.S. military carried out a war game that was widely understood to be a simulation of an invasion of Iran. It went badly. America suffered more than 20,000 casualties in a single day, and officials halted the game. So the question is not, could America beat Iran? Yes, it could. The question is, is it ready to try? Well, less ready than ever, actually. Compared to 2003, our country is deeper in debt and far more politically divided than it's been since the Civil War. Our military is overstretched, ask anyone in it. Meanwhile, China is much stronger than it was 15 years ago. You can bet the Chinese military will be more assertive than ever when we're tied down in yet another quagmire. Does anyone outside of Washington actually support a new war in Iran? Well, the Saudi royal family does. So the leaders of other Sunni Gulf states, they see Iran as their greatest rival, and they'd love to have America fight a war against Iran for them. Why wouldn't they? President Trump's own supporters know better than this, though. You'll remember that back in 2016, during the Republican primary debate in South Carolina, Donald Trump was the only person on that stage to call the Iraq war a mistake. He vowed never to repeat anything like that and promised that if elected, he would act only in America's interests. Now, the morons handicapping the debate on television predicted Trump would lose. It was over. Saying that had sealed his fate. And, of course, they were wrong, and he won. Republican voters agreed with him, it turned out. They had a better sense of the truth. A lot of their kids were serving in the military. Two and a half years later, amazingly, the president's advisors are telling him he must abandon that promise. Iran is too important, they say. It's the greatest threat this country faces, despite the fact that virtually every terror and attack in America has been inspired not by Iran, but by Iran's Sunni enemies. Doesn't matter. The mullahs are months away from building a nuke, the neocons tell us. Keep in mind, these people have been saying the exact same thing word for word for more than a decade. You can look it up on Google. They have no idea what they're talking about. Their track records are embarrassing, disaster after disaster. They ought to be selling timeshares in Maui or doing something useful. 
Instead, they have more political power than they've ever had. Amazingly, almost to a person, this same group bitterly opposed the president they now work for. They repeatedly attacked him in public, and they attacked him savagely in private. They consider his ideas absurd to this day. They regard the notion of putting America first as morally offensive. They are fully on Bill Kristol's team. In fact, just last week, Crystal was encouraging Nikki Haley to challenge her boss, Donald Trump, for the Republican nomination two years from now, in a way that makes sense. If there was ever a swamp in Washington, you are looking at it, the foreign policy establishment. They are working overtime to ensnare the president in a mess in Iran. Let's hope that he understands exactly what's going on. Douglas McGregor is a retired Army colonel, author of the book Margin of Victory a frequent guest on the show, and he joins us tonight. Colonel Gregor, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks, Tucker. I appreciate it. So the, I, I can't help, since I've been in Washington for 30 years, notice that the very people who are pushing this new entanglement, this new enterprise, are the, Trump's, the, the Trump administration's great, gravest enemies on almost every subject. And they are also the same people who predicted outcomes that never came to pass. In other words, they've been wrong again and again and again and again. How do these people still have power? Well, look, I think uh, President Trump lost control of the whole appointment process and staffing the government shortly after the election. I don't know the details, but he ended up appointing large numbers of people who subsequently brought in their friends, almost all of whom were opposed to Donald Trump and his agenda. But I think it's important to say something about the president's comment, because the president's right. If you look at the Iranian defense establishment, we spend more money on one Ford-class aircraft carrier than Iran spends on its entire military establishment. So if there were a war, it would be a very one-sided affair. But the problem is yes. that wars don't work that way. They tend to move in directions that no one anticipated. Suddenly people that you would think would otherwise avoid conflict might decide that it's not in their interest to see Iran destroyed. And I'm thinking of Russia and I'm thinking of China as perfect examples. Why would they stand by and watch us pulverize Iran? It seems very unlikely. So I think President Trump understands that. In fact, this afternoon when he talked to the VFW, he made the comment that uh, he pulled out of the deal with Iran, but he's open to another deal. He's open to talking, to negotiating. He's talked to the Russians, and he's talked to the North Koreans. That seems to have had a positive impact, certainly in Northeast Asia. We don't know what will happen in the future, but I think that's a good sign. So I think dealing with Donald Trump, understand that anyone who threatens the United States with this man in the White House should seek psychiatric care. They're crazy because... Donald Trump means what he says. He will fight to defend the United States. On the other hand, I don't see any evidence that he's interested in precipitating a conflict. Do you, do you think the advisors around him, whose comments we just played, Nikki Haley, for example, or John Bolton, I mean, they seem to come at this with pre-existing agendas. Well, of course, but the good news is that President Trump hasn't listened very much to his advisors. If he did, we would never have made any progress on the Korean Peninsula. We would not be <laughs> working point. with the Chinese. We, wouldn't, we would never have met with Vladimir Putin. So God bless the president. He doesn't listen to these people. So I, I'm not too worried about that. The thing that does worry me, though, given the, the, some of the comments that are being made, is this red meat on the table for the war lobby. You and I know that there are a lot of people who would welcome conflict with Iran. That's obvious. I think the president yeah. needs to watch carefully for the potential for something like the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Many of your yes. viewers may not remember that. It never happened. And we could very well I'm be aware. treated to something like that in the Gulf. We should watch for that. And this is, an, this is an example of President Trump's comments on fake news. He should not be sabotaged by fake news. I, I agree. We, we've seen it happen twice in Syria. Twice. Uh, Colonel, thank you very much. Great to see you. Intelligence services in virtually every overfunded think tank in Washington have suddenly aligned tonight on a single point of agreement. America must go to war in Syria immediately. Bashar al-Assad cannot continue to lead that country. He must be overthrown. Assad is an evil man, they tell us. His latest crime is a chlorine gas attack carried out over the weekend by his forces against a rebel-held suburb of Damascus. Assad's poison gas suffocated children. Pictures of the aftermath of that are all over the Internet, and they are horrifying. Assad is a monster. That's the official story. Almost everyone in power claims to believe it. The push to war in Syria, by the way, has united politicians from both sides. Lindsey Graham and Howard Dean typically agree on very little.
not much at all. But today, they are both calling for war in Syria. Graham is demanding massive attacks on the Syrian military. Dean is going even further than that. On Twitter, he called the president, quote, a wimp for merely sending thousands of troops and launching tons of bombs at Syria. That's not enough for Howard Dean, who, as you may remember, once ran for president as the peace candidate. Tonight, he wants total war in Syria. Television pundits, of course, strongly agree. This morning, the foreign policy team over on MSNBC explained that it's far more important for American troops to fight in Syria than it is to secure our own border here in America. Watch. There's no question that now, uh, all these years later, it is Donald Trump's, Donald Trump's challenge. He has to take action. He's right. spoken to Macron. What he ought to do is a coordinated action. There has to be a comprehensive response. As Trump leaves to fight his imaginary border war, he's leaving the real war where we could make a difference and said he's turning it over to Assad and to Iran and to ISIS. This is something that Barack Obama uh, wouldn't even do if, if confronted with these set of facts. Trump has to take action in Syria, everyone nods sagely. That ought to make you nervous. Universal bipartisan agreement on anything is usually the first sign that something deeply unwise is about to happen, if only because there is nobody left to ask skeptical questions. And we should be skeptical of this, starting with the poison gas attack itself. All the geniuses tell us that Assad killed those children. But do they really know that? Of course they don't really know that. They're making it up. They have no real idea what happened. Actually, both sides in the Syrian civil war possess chemical weapons. How would it benefit Assad using chlorine gas last weekend? Well, it wouldn't. Assad's forces had been winning the war in Syria. The administration just announced its plans to pull American troops out of Syria, having vanquished ISIS. That's good news for Assad. And about the only thing he could do to reverse it and to hurt himself would be to use poison gas against children. Well, he did it anyway, they tell us. He's that evil. Please. Keep in mind, this is the same story they told us last April. Do you remember that? It was almost exactly a year ago. The new administration announced it was no longer seeking to depose Assad from power. Regime change was no longer our policy. So the usual war chorus in Washington started yelping, went berserk, and days later, Assad supposedly used sarin gas against civilians in Syria. There was video. We bombed a Syrian airbase in response to that. At the time, this show asked what seemed like the obvious question, are we really sure that Assad did that? It seems weirdly timed and counterproductive to him. Shut up, they explained. Of course we're sure. What an unpatriotic question. But of course they were lying. Two months ago, the Secretary of Defense admitted that actually, we still have no proof that Assad used sarin gas last year. The story, it turns out, was propaganda. It was designed to manipulate Americans, just like so much of what they say. We've seen this movie before, and we know how it ends.